Well, hello again everybody. And as you can see, I'm carrying on today with our surface mount. But I'm also going to have a go at using a hot air rework station and a hot plate for soldering, both of which I haven't used before, so that should be interesting. So the resistors that I'm on with placing at the moment, these are 805 size, and I think I have had just a little bit of practice since I last saw you, just today, it's the same day. And I think I am starting to get the hang of it just a little bit more. Although you can see I've got that one slightly cocked off to one side. Not that it really matters, but let's see if we can just smarten that up a bit. And I'm also trying to tie down my soldering temperatures just a little bit more. But I am still around 345 degrees, which to me it just seems like it's a little low. But I have tried using high temperatures and I haven't necessarily got better results. Now as you can see I've still got a tendency to use a little bit too much solder but I think things are improving slowly. Oops that's cocked up hasn't it, let's push him down. Okay let's take a closer look at them, see what that's like. So I think we've got a little bit too much solder there on R13 but going on to R14 I actually think R14 that does look pretty good doesn't it? R15, the left hand side I think looks okay, but the right hand side has maybe got too much solder. R16, and I've just spotted R19 that I've done, that's not very good. Oh dear, let's see if I can correct that. Oh, it's all going horribly wrong. I'm sure this is the point where you should just take it off and have another go, so that's what we'll do. Oh, it's stuck to the tweezers. Yeah. Let's try some of the 0603 resistors now. I'm going to start off just the same by trying to just tin the pad. And what I would say, on the 0603 size, I think I'm getting to the point now where I'm starting to need the microscope. All the other things, I could actually pretty much just see what I was doing, but now, no, I'm at that point now where I definitely need that little bit of magnification. I think I'd probably still be okay if I was using one of these desktop magnifiers, but certainly, um, yeah, I would need a little bit of assistance so I'm looking through the actual Understar microscope now and already that's presenting me with some problems now one thing I've just noticed is that because these components are so small um, I've got a bit of flux must be on the end of my tweezers and I'm struggling to actually let go of things everything is sticking together so I don't know maybe I can, can I just tack that down I'm going to try tacking the left hand side on without any additional flux and then maybe I'll come back and reflow it. Let's see if that works for me. We'll just do this last 0603 and then we'll do some inspection. And I'm just trying to get a little bit of solder, it's really difficult. Definitely on there, too much solder. I think R35 looks okay. And finally R36, it does look as though I've got it offset slightly to the right hand side. But I think I've not done a bad job of putting the solder on there. Finally time to meet my nemesis. I'm going to have a go at these 0402s. I think I'm struggling as much here just looking through the microscope because I'm just not very used to it as of yet. Well, that side's down, although I've got a feeling it might be cocked up at a little bit of an angle, I'm not sure. Well, I'm going to call him done. Let's get another one. Now, I definitely wouldn't be able to do this without the aid of a microscope of some description. I can barely see these.
So I'm struggling with that one. It's got a dull finish on it again. I wonder if putting a little bit more flux on top of it will help. Let's try that. I think I've probably got the right amount of solder on there. Okay, that looks better, doesn't it? So, yeah, flux is maybe the key. Shall I touch up the other side? I think the other side looks pretty good, but I'm going to go and interfere with it anyway. Let's try that. I wonder if I've got enough solder on my iron to do the other side. Shall we try it? For comparison you can see that I've dropped a quarter watt resistor on top of our circuit board so these 0402s really are absolutely tiny. So looking at the first one looks as though it's fairly well placed on the pads to me. Solder could maybe be a little bit shinier. The next one does look pretty shiny but it's kind of off to one side to the bottom. This one seems to be twisted very slightly doesn't it? And the final one, again, looks a little bit twisted. Let's take a look from the side. So it looks like this guy went surfing today. I don't think the right-hand side of this one looks bad. We've got too much solder on the left-hand side, I think. I think maybe this one looks not too bad. And finally this one, again, it looks as though I've got a little bit too much solder going on there. I'm going to finish off with our precision soldering iron today by having a go at soldering in this SOP16 package. Now I've also gone ahead and I've changed the tip in my soldering iron so rather than using the little chisel blade that I'm familiar with I've actually now got, I think they call this a knife blade tip because these are described as I think as a bit of a universal tip that you can almost do anything with them and apparently you can drag solder with them. I'm not exactly sure what the technique is to drag solder with one of these because although they've been recommended I haven't really seen anybody using them so maybe that tells a story. So it might work or it might also go horribly wrong. So I think we start off in exactly the same way by just putting a little blob on one of the pads here. We're going to tack down one of the legs to hold everything down so can we do that? OK, I think I've got a bit of solder on there. I struggled there with this wedge-shaped tip. I suspect I wasn't really holding it correctly. I'm not sure. Now this time I'm going to go in with some flux because it makes everything easier. And of course far too much is just the correct amount. Might as well put some on that side while I'm here. Here we go. Can I drag this along? Well, that worked like magic, didn't it? That looks good to me. I think I can reach it most easily this way around. Let's have a go this way. Don't think I had enough solder there. Let me just reload this. Go another go. Well, you know what? I'm so proud of myself. I'm going to have another quick go. And I've decided this time to use the chisel tip that I used for the resistors. And lots of flux. I've put the JBC precision soldering station to one side so let's take a look at our next item which is going to be a hot plate. I'm sure that you'll remember that in part one of the video the person that I bought this equipment from said that it hadn't had a lot of use. Well, looking at it, well I'm pretty sure it hasn't been used at all. It looks absolutely brand new. So I can see here we've got, is that a continental plug? So unfortunately that's not a lot of use for me but well we can always cut the end off it and reuse the lead I suppose. Let's put that one on one side. 
I can see that we've got an instruction manual. You know that I don't really like to read instruction manuals, but let's just check the quality of the manual. Okay, so I can see that this hot plate has got a power consumption of 800 watts and it's got a temperature range of between 50 and 350 degrees centigrade. And it's got a resistive heating element. Okay, well it looks like only the first three pages of this manual are actually in English and then the rest of it is in Chinese. I don't suppose that really matters. I mean, it's a hot plate. How complicated can it be? First impressions is that this is a relatively well-built and weighty unit. In fact, it probably weighs in about the same as a six-banded armadillo. So I'm guessing at the top here we've got the actual heating element, which just comes in the form of, well, I can see that this is quite a finely machined aluminium pad. Certainly is reflective. I wonder how flat that is. Well, there's just a very, very tiny bow to it. Just slightly convex, but I'm not too concerned about that. It is actually pretty good. Feels like we've got quite a meaty, thick slab of aluminium here, so kind of no expense spared. Now, any equipment I purchase from China, I do just like to check that we've got some basic safety stuff going on inside, so I'm just going to take the cover off. Let's have a look inside, make sure it's actually earthed. So I'm not going to totally dismantle this unit, but I can see we've got some type of control board and a power transistor. It looks like the actual heating element itself is actually directly powered from the mains rather than being a low voltage heater. So I'm guessing that the, uh, the transformer on here must be for the low voltage logic. You can see that we've got some rather heavy wiring. Actually, it does feel like... Yeah, that is actually um, high temperature wire. So we've got some high temperature wire here that's going down to the heating element. Also we've got what I'm guessing is a thermocouple probe. And again, that's in some uh, like fiberglass sleeving. Got the main switch on the front. Hmm, interestingly enough, the actual mains terminals here on the switch, they're not actually insulated. So if you were working in here with it switched on, you'd have to be a little bit careful and in fact just looking at the uh, terminals that go on to the IEC connector none of those are insulated so yeah that's a little bit naughty isn't it so just turning the unit around we can see that the power does come in via this IEC connector here it's got two earths on it now to me that doesn't look quite right I've actually seen some other teardowns of these units and I think one of the earth wires should actually go through to the hot plate which is at the bottom because the hot plate is operating at mains voltage or it's got a mains heating element 230 volts so I'm guessing you really want to hearth the hot plate but it looks like somebody's actually done a bit of a bodge job here we've got two connectors two points of earthing but they're both on the same metal chassis so that actually seems a little bit pointless so I think what we might do at some point in the future but not now is probably take this apart and just make sure that we have got some earthing going directly to the hot plate now talking of earthing we've got this separate panel that's got the transformer mounted on it now one side of the transformer has got a primary at 230 volts so of course if we got some kind of short circuit or a fault on the transformer it's quite possible that this metal plate could become live and it especially could become live because it's not got an earth on it so really what I would like to see is an earth lead installed probably between maybe the transformer or using one of these separate we've got various separate uh, lugs and screw mounting points here so really this should have its own earth cable going from this back panel or from the transformer and back to the main earthing point here but yeah that's why we need to do a little bit of inspection when we get equipment from China because well they seem to have a rather good imagination when it comes to how equipment should be earthed certainly this doesn't look right does it but we can fix that another time Although I'm not going to do it at this moment in time, I would definitely recommend paying some attention to earthing on equipment like this, in particular this type of equipment, because we've got a heating element. Now this heating element is operating at 230 volts. Now because it's a heating element, it gets hot and cold, and that means thermally it's quite highly stressed, and you do get failure of heating elements. Now, one of the failures of a heating element, a typical failure mode, might very much be a short circuit. 
an actual breakdown of the insulation and it could actually short circuit to this metal panel on the top here. Now if you happen to be touching that panel you would obviously get quite a nasty electric shock. I have told you and I've demonstrated in the past that an ohm meter like this isn't the correct type of equipment for checking earth integrity because it doesn't actually put enough current through the earth system to prove it. But that is all I'm going to do to check it today because a check is better than no check, 0.3 of an ohm. So it does look to be earthed well enough, but it is only earthed at the moment. It's just earthed through the nuts and bolts, which uh, isn't correct. I mean, we do have some protection here in the UK in that my supply to my workshop, in fact, the, all the plug sockets in my house, they are protected by an earth leakage circuit breaker. So even if we get a very small leakage of current to earth, it will actually switch the equipment off. Okay, time for the money shot. Let's get it plugged in and switched on and see if it works. Well, it is definitely starting to heat up. Actually though, the temperature indication doesn't seem to quite be matching the hot plate temperature. It actually feels a lot hotter than the 40 degrees that's indicated. So we will check that. So the unit's been on about 30 seconds now and it's only increased from about 50 to 100 degrees. So it does actually ramp up relatively slowly. So we've got an indicated temperature here of 95 degrees and it's actually showing 100 on the actual display here. I actually think that's pretty good actually. I think that's, you know, really close enough for anything I'd want to do. Will it go up a bit if we just tweak that? Okay, 100.4 degrees, so I'm going to call that more than good enough. And let's just check the thermocouple on the outside edge, because again, I don't think it's making contact. Okay, so that's measuring about 93 degrees. So we've actually only got about a 7 degree variance between the centre of the hot plate and the outside. That seems very good to me. As I say, just ignore these readings. The thermocouples aren't making a good contact. Okay, let's try our maximum temperature that we can set. So it looks like I think what you can do is you can just make it count up like that but I think you can select the digit. Okay 350, okay that's gone to maximum. So let's see how long it takes to ramp up to 350 degrees. I've got an infrared thermometer here, it probably won't work particularly well on the metal. In fact it's indicating 36 degrees on the metal but if I put it on the captain tape itself we should get a better reading. So that's indicating about 236. And that's indicating 226, so about 10 degrees difference. So I'm guessing we're definitely in the ballpark there. So it's taken about two minutes to reach 350 degrees and just checking the temperature. Pretty good, this is measuring 355 degrees. So I think that's really pretty close, isn't it? I've allowed our hot plate to cool down for 10 minutes. We're going to switch it back on and see if the unit does draw 800 watts. If those are English watts or Chinese watts, let's switch on. Okay, and that is bang on. I think that's about 804 watts. So, yep, yeah, it does do what it claims to do. So the hot plate has heated itself again to about 300 degrees and I switched it off a few minutes ago. Now we can actually see in this top aluminium plate there must be an awful lot of thermal mass because even though I can look at my watt meter here, the watt meter isn't showing any power at all but our temperature is still at, what is that, about 246, 245 degrees. As you actually look at it, can you see how slowly it's falling. So we're guessing this is a quite a chunky piece of aluminium here. It's got it's got a lot of thermal mass. Now my room, it's actually a bit smoky and smelly in here because I think there must be some preservatives and some lacquers probably on the underside of the hot plate. They always burn off the first time you use something like this. The top of the unit is uncomfortable to touch. Certainly you would burn yourself if you put your hand on that. And I'd like to say that lower side of the unit is also quite hot. But yeah, it's not unbearable, but a piece of equipment like this, you need to treat it with respect, don't you? And be careful how you operate it. A few months ago I was working on a board, not entirely dissimilar to this one, maybe a little bit larger. And what I had to do was remove one of these relatively large quad flat packs. And I was having some problems. Now normally the way that I would remove this, I would simply just get my Stanley knife here. And all you actually have to do is you cut the legs, go around all four sides of it, break the legs through, and then you can simply get your normal soldering iron and you can kind of sweep the old legs away and the component will just fall off the board. That 
that's the easy way to do it. But unfortunately, in this case, I actually wanted to keep the IC. So, of course, cutting the legs off it was not an option. So what I decided to do was to use my hot air station to actually remove it, because hot air is one of the easiest way to remove chips like this. So on the bench, I've got my old 852 hot air station. Now, I've actually had this station for well it's probably about 10 years now these are actually relatively low cost and I've got to admit generally speaking I've had no complaints about this it's actually had quite a lot of use and it's always worked fairly well especially for the smaller components but unfortunately when I was trying to remove this particular IC I'm not going to try to do it now but basically what you do is you heat everything up you keep going round it I did have a bigger nozzle on before anybody comments it but basically you go around it you keep going around it and eventually the hot air coming out of the end of here it will actually melt the solder and you can just pick the IC up and pull it off but unfortunately in the case of the board that I was soldering using this solder station I just couldn't get enough heat into the board so the problem that I was having trying to remove this IC is that even though I was using my hot air station here to actually heat everything up the problem was the actual circuit board itself was actually quite large and with it being a multi-layer board it had a lot of thermal mass and it was just acting as a big heat sink so however much heat I actually put into the local area it didn't actually manage to get the solder up to a temperature where it would melt and I could remove the chip so in the end I had to uh, I had to give up and use another method but I really wanted to use a hot air station now at the time when I was trying to remove this IC I didn't actually have a hot plate but if I had what we would have actually done is we could have put the board onto the hot plate and we could have preheated it now we don't actually have to raise the board up to the temperature that the solder melts we just have to raise it up as much as we can above ambient so I've got no doubt that probably if we set this hot plate to 150 degrees we're probably quite close to the melting point of the solder and I'm guessing at 150 degrees probably most of this plastic would be okay it wouldn't be a problem so then having preheated the board what we can then do is we can go in with our hot air station and I'm sure that this would pop off a treat Now there is actually another method that we can use to remove ICs and in fact quite a lot of components from this board and we can remove those components all in one go and I like to call that the redneck method. Now back in the day I used to take a paint stripper gun and I would actually take the gun, I would put it on the back of the board and then you would actually take the board and you would actually bang it onto a piece of wood and all the components would jump out and that seemed to work for both through hole components and surface mount and we used to use that method back in the day when we used to actually have to salvage components because you know they weren't generally available to amateur electronics people like me so we had to strip them out of old radios and televisions and that's one way you could do it now of course that method wasn't very controllable so what I'm wondering is can we put this circuit board onto the hot plate maybe set it to 200 degrees and can we get the board hot enough to actually just melt all the solder and then pull all the components off or even just knock them off I'm willing to give it a try let's find out Okay, so the top of my board, well, unfortunately, it's still relatively cold. So according to this, I'm just moving it round and I'm getting a few different readings depending where I point it. I'm actually only at about 67 degrees on here. So, yeah, we're actually quite a long way off, aren't we? We will actually leave it to warm up a bit. I'm going to try the finger test. Yeah, okay, that's not particularly hot yet. Let's keep going. Okay, we're just over 300 degrees now, and our board's at about 137 degrees. I think we're going to have to go all the way, aren't we? Let's put it right up to 400. Well, unfortunately, the maximum temperature I can set on the hot plate is 350 degrees. Okay, well, certainly the through hole components are desoldering themselves. Oh, actually, our surface mount devices are all coming off there. The resistors are anyway. Yep, yeah, okay, I can just push the resistors off now. So they are free. Okay, there's an IC out. Will these sockets come out? Okay, there we go. Oh, I think that might be free. Okay, and there's... There's the IC come off.
Well, that is very redneck, isn't it? Well, as you can see, we did actually manage to remove quite a lot of the components here. A mixture of through-hole components. We've got some IC sockets here. We've got our large flat pack chip here that came off without any problems. Also, what I'm guessing there, it's got a label on top of it. That maybe looks like an EEPROM, I'm not exactly sure. And maybe some memory chips or something like that. So they did come off quite easily. Got to admit, I had to put considerably more heat into our board than I was expecting. So you can actually see that we've got so much heat into it now. I can see that the surface of the board, it's actually all ripply. So the actual fiberglass material, it started to delaminate. So yeah, that isn't any use for anything but kind of destructive removal. Don't think we could actually use this to uh, rework a board. So certainly the idea of preheating is a good idea. We can certainly preheat a board to make it easier to use a soldering iron or a heat gun to remove the other tools. But maybe it is just uh, a bit of a step too far to actually use this technique for actually removing components themselves. Although having said that, I suspect that these won't actually be damaged. I just don't think there's really any advantages to doing it the way I've done it. So yeah, don't do this. It was just an experiment. You win some, you lose some. Well, having just used our hot plate to remove this really quite fine pitch QFP, I think we should have a go at trying to solder it back on. This is certainly the finest pitch that I would have tried soldering up to now. So yeah, let's see if we can put it back on. Starting with a good dollop of flux there, I've actually got some leaded solder on the end of the iron, a big ball of solder. I'm actually working it along the tracks there, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to combine it with the unleaded solder that's on the board. And then I've taken some solder braid, and I'm just trying to mop up that combined solder, because it's much easier to solder with leaded rather than unleaded, so I'm just cleaning up the tracks now. I found it really difficult to get these very fine component legs to actually line up with the pads on the circuit board and actually what kept happening, the pins on the IC, they kept going into the ruts between the pads and when you actually pushed the actual IC it would get stuck and then all of a sudden it would just jump and move by quite a long way. The other thing that really didn't help, as you can see, the actual field of view here is relatively small. So although I found that I could maybe get one side of the IC lined up, when I came to look at the other side, the opposite corner, I was out by an absolute mile. So it did take me some time to try to line everything up and it still wasn't perfect. Now once I had lined everything up, what I did was I went away and I tacked down all the corners of it, just as we did previously. Now I'm also going to try some drag soldering now. You can probably see that I don't think my soldering iron placement is really very good in that I'm really just concentrating on the pins and not on the pads there. But it does seem to be working, but we do seem to be picking up quite a lot of solder on the way. And of course because I did put too much solder on, I ended up wicking some of it away. So after applying another very generous dollop of flux, I changed out the chisel tip for one of these knife shaped soldering bits and I actually think that that was doing a better job. Now again the actual placement of the bit isn't very good in that I seem to be working against the pins here. Really you want to be on both the pads and the pins but I am doing my best. But I think the knife shaped tip did make an improvement. I'm not sure but the temperature could have been a little bit too hot here because you can see that the flux is really boiling off. OK, let's see how we did. So starting with side one, I think that I've got the tracks there on the IC fairly well lined up with the pads. And to me they look as though they are soldered OK. Let's turn it round and see if we can go in a bit closer. <laughs> However, on side two, some of the pins seem to be fairly well lined up with the tracks, but also some of them then aren't so good. So I'm not quite sure what happened there. 
It could be that when I actually removed this IC that maybe I dropped it on one of the pins and uh, because I was using pin 1 as a reference here maybe it moved everything along but some of them do seem to line up and some of them not. As I said I really did struggle with the alignment. I found this the, the hardest part of the whole process was actually just trying to line it up and of course it really didn't help by the fact that we couldn't see that all the way around the chip we could only just see a few of the pins. So what had happened is I get one pin lined up perfectly but unfortunately the pin well I can't even move it over because we're hitting the back of the microscope. I'll have to turn the board round going to the opposite side here you get one pin lined up and then you come to the opposite side and unfortunately it wouldn't be lined up okay it looks like I might have managed to get a solder bridge there but I'm guessing we could probably fairly easily clean that up I did also check that all the pins on the IC were actually making contact here with the pads and that they were soldered down so just using the ends of my tweezers here I'm just pushing against the legs gently that one's about half a pad out isn't it as is that one as is that one so yeah a little bit off alignment but I have actually checked every pad and uh, yeah they are actually all soldered down correctly well I think I'm going to score my efforts at soldering one of these large fine pitch ICs I think I'm going to give myself just a 5 out of 10 because it's a long way from perfect but well I don't think it's too bad for a first attempt is it but room for improvement I've got my old hot air station on the bench and I know that it would really struggle to remove this IC but what we've done is we've actually preheated the board we've got the hot plate set to about 150 degrees so just giving the IC a little bit of a, a prod can see that it is actually still fixed down but I'm thinking that really we shouldn't have to put anywhere near as much heat into this to actually get it off now again not exactly sure but we'll we'll give it a go unfortunately it'd probably be better if I had a bigger nozzle to do this with but unfortunately don't have one this is the biggest one we've got bit of flux there burning off but yeah so I just picked off this IC using this little vacuum pickup tool these are available cheaply and they are actually quite useful so just a warning with these very low cost vacuum pickup tools they never actually work as they come out the box here so you can actually see that they have this kind of bent needle affair on it and in the case of this actual vacuum tool the actual needle just pushes on well there's no seal on here so if you actually press the button down release it well I can just feel that there's actually no vacuum whereas if I take the needle tip off it press it down you probably can't hear it but when I actually take my thumb off it goes with a click as the air enters it so unfortunately because these vacuum tools do leak air what it actually means is when you actually go to pick up a component you pick it up and then you probably moved it half a centimetre and it falls off the end of your tool so we can almost but not quite pick up this button cell because unfortunately the vacuum just leaks away and it ends up dropping it so it isn't actually anything wrong with the suction cups or anything like that it's purely because there's air leaking into the system around the nozzle so what you've got to do is you need to take something like some epoxy adhesive just put something around there push the needle on and then everything will be good and it will work properly so all I'm going to do is I'm going to take our epoxy resin and of course far too much is just the right amount in this case of course being careful not to get it down the centre of the nozzle I'm going to put this on now have we got that about straight? Probably not. Okay, so I think that's about straight. So all we're going to do is leave this for five minutes for the uh, the epoxy to go off, and we'll give it another go. It should work better. Problem solved. Well, just to finish off today, I've got another surface mount demo kit. But this time we're not going to solder it together using a soldering iron. We're actually going to try to do it using the hot plate. And to help us do that I've got something that they call solder paste. Now as you can see solder paste comes in a little bit of a tube. Well of course solder is lead and tin and it isn't actually a paste. So what we've got here is some ground up solder and it's ground very finely into little balls and what they do is they actually mix it with some flux paste and it actually forms kind of like a sticky 
flux and solder mess. So the way you actually use this, you use it in what they call a reflow technique. So what we do is we apply some of this solder paste to the pads and then what we do is we put the components on top and then we heat the board up. Now there's a few different ways you can actually heat the board up. The most conventional way is actually to put it through what they call a reflow oven which is kind of like an infrared sunbed for printed circuit boards. But what it consists of is a conveyor belt and on top of the conveyor belt you've got some infrared lamps. So what happens is the actual board travels into the solder reflow machine and it goes under the infrared lamps and what happens is this solder paste that we've put on here it actually gets red hot, gets to the temperature where the solder will actually melt. I think they've actually given us a little leaflet here. You can see these little graphs. So what they're actually telling us here, they're actually telling us the temperatures at which the solder will melt. And that's what you would have to set your oven to. Well, unfortunately, I don't have a reflow oven. So the way we're going to try to do it is we're going to take our solder paste. We're going to put some little drops on the pads here, drop the components on top. And then we're going to take the whole circuit board and we're going to put it onto the top of the hot plate. And in theory, if we set the temperature correctly, it should actually melt the solder without actually burning the back of the board but we didn't have a lot of success last time but maybe that's because we were using unleaded solder I'm not actually sure whether this is leaded or not I don't know if it says anywhere so I'm going to take absolutely no care at all doing this and see how we go so let's start off by just putting some blobs of this solder paste onto here you can see it running up the syringe Yeah, actually it's quite difficult to actually dispense this by hand and get small amounts. Now the way that you would normally do this if you were doing it by hand, you can actually get what they call the dispensing tool and basically you press a foot pedal and what happens is the actual plunger moves forward by a very small and defined amount and that way you can put a very small blob of paste down. Now alternatively you would use what they call a soldering stencil which actually will put just the right amount of solder onto the pads but yeah as I said earlier we don't have one of those so let me grab some of these resistors I'm just going to plunk them on and we'll see how we go. Now you can actually see that I'm actually able to place these resistors really quite quickly and actually this method is probably even faster than doing through hole soldering and placement of components. So if you actually do have a soldering stencil and you can put the correct amount of paste down it is a really nice easy way to actually build circuit boards very quickly. Again not really taking any care over this let's just bung them on. And finally let's just try this SOP16 package and again I can't exactly place this solder paste onto the pads so what we're actually going to do is we're going to kind of put a, try and put a thin layer on all of them which would look almost nothing like that because that isn't a thin layer but that's what we're going to do. We're going to put some on here. So in theory what should happen is when this solder starts to melt it should actually form a little blob on the pad itself and the surface tension should actually clean all that up. Now I don't think it will because I have made such a mess of it but we'll find out. Taking a close look at my solder pad I thought that I'd actually bought a leaded solder but just looking at the code number it looks as though it is actually unleaded so I'm going to have to use a higher temperature than I wanted to so this might not work out as well as we expected. Well for some reason the camera switched off at just the wrong time there. Well talk about sods law, as soon as the board got to temperature my camera turned itself off just as we were getting to the money shop but we can actually see that these components they have actually soldered themselves onto the board. Now the soldering doesn't look perfect but it doesn't look totally awful and even the back of the board doesn't seem to be burnt so that did seem to work. So I've quickly rushed together another board. I'm afraid you can tell I've rushed it because it's got even more solder paste on it but I didn't want you to miss the money shot so we're going to go again. So we're at 150 degrees and you can see that the solder paste is actually quite runny and we've actually got far too much paste on there. Now when this melts it does actually transition from solid to liquid really quite quickly and in just a few degrees. So we're at 190 degrees now, I don't think we might be that far off. In fact there we go, can you see it?
and of course we now need to extract our circuit board without getting third degree burns I'm really not sure if these large balls of solder that have formed are making a good connection to the pads or not really we had just far too much solder paste going on and uh, we can actually see that the first attempt which didn't go on camera it does actually seem a lot better than the second attempt but I did kind of rush the second attempt and I was a bit sloppy I found it pretty much impossible to actually put the solder paste down using a syringe by hand. You always put far too much down, but I think in principle it does work. Well, I hope you enjoyed our hot plate experiments, but I think for today that'll do. So until next time, as always, thanks very much for watching, and I hope to see you again very soon. Until then, bye-bye for now.